so we are now going to shift gears uh, within the still in the genitourinary realm uh, by Kim Rathmel. Thanks. Okay, I also want to thank the organizers for that opportunity to talk about um, some of the work in kidney cancer um, and also for organizing uh, the session such that uh, we come a little bit later. Kidney cancer has been um, a little bit late to develop and so um, uh, you've already been uh, prepped for some of the things uh, that I'm going to talk about. So um, first, um, kidney cancer, like pancreatic cancer, has been on the rise. And um, although this is a somewhat dated slide, um, you can see that uh, dating back to the 70s, we've been seeing a steady increase in this cancer. And so although it was originally um, characterized as a rare tumor type, it really is not anymore. And um, uh, this uh, talk will focus on one subtype of kidney cancer. That's clear cell histology, renal cell carcinoma. Uh, this is a um, histology slide showing uh, why it's called clear cell. It has these um, uh, cells with cleared cytoplasm. This tumor is characterized by a particular mutation, and that's mutation in the von Hippel-Lindau gene um, coordinate with loss of chromosome 3P where VHL is housed. Uh, we see these mutations and loss of 3P, which houses other tumor suppressors as well, in up to 90% of these tumors. And based on this strong correlation between clear cell type renal cell carcinoma and the VHL mutation, um, our, our tumor type has uh, a very distinct paradigm um, in which VHL loss causes upregulation of hypoxia-inducible factors, and these tumors are characterized by high levels of these HIF factors. These are transcription factors that normally allow cells to respond to low levels of oxygen by turning on a repertoire of genes that allow them to uh, bring in new blood vessels new blood vessels to shift their metabolic properties to migrate away, to um, promote survival and to de-differentiate. And so that's a perfect storm for kidney cancer in some respects. Because this cancer has been highly unresponsive to chemotherapy, there's been much effort in recent years on developing um, targeted agents. And these targeted agents to date all focus on this uh, well-known pathway in clear cell type renal cell carcinoma. Most of the um, of the agents focus far down on this pathway, uh, targeting the receptors of VEGF and PDGF. These are tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are effective <coughs> at reducing the tumor uh, angiogenic profile and can be quite effective at reducing the bulk of these diseases. Uh, other uh, drugs similarly target this pathway, uh, for example, targeting uh, features of the tumor that enable HIF to be stabilized, such as the mTOR pathway, so that uh, Tempsorolimus, Everolimus are approved drugs that we use, and there are in-development drugs targeting um, MET, which is another uh, mutation that can occur in this cancer and sim similarly increases HIF uh, levels. But the reality of treating kidney cancer is that the available drugs that we have do not produce complete responses. We only uh, work in the arena of minimal response and partial response. The extent of response that a patient will get is unpredictable. The duration is also unpredictable, and the toxicity is unpredictable. And for drugs that we expect to uh, uh, be effective on average for one to two years, this is chronic therapy, it's very expensive, and it's dominated by effects that um, are substantially uh, detrimental to quality of life, fatigue, rash, diarrhea, as well as laboratory abnormalities that indicate uh, damage to the liver or um, elevations in glucose and cholesterol. So with that, I'll talk about um, various molecular probes that we use to understand some of the diversity or the heterogeneity across the clear cell, uh, renal cell carcinoma uh, spectrum. So before I really dive into clear cell renal cell carcinoma, I do have to point out that there are other histologies of this tumor as well. So when we say kidney cancer, we're talking about a big spectrum. Clear cell renal cell carcinoma is that that's tied very closely to von Hippel-Lindau disease and loss of 3P, and it's about 70% of all the cases that we encounter of tumors in the kidney. But there are also other types, papillary type renal cell carcinoma, chromophobe, a benign tumor, oncocytoma, a translocation carcinoma, and some other very rare types. And these types of tumors, we really have very little um, in terms of knowledge of how to treat these uh, patients, and their genetics are highly distinct from clear cell type renal cell carcinoma. So someday in the future, we'll understand not only how to treat um, our clear cell renal cell carcinoma patients, but have um, 
uh, effective uh, molecular information to target these cancers as well. So clear cell type renal cell carcinoma has been well known to be molecularly heterogeneous for some time. This is a gene expression profile. I'm too tall for this mic. Sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Okay. I'll try not to drift away. So, um, uh, so you've already seen uh, heat maps from uh, several of these other talks looking at gene expression profiles. And as you can see, the gene expression profile across a large group of tumors here um, suggests that there are, are uh, great areas of variability with at least two and maybe as many as five groups based on uh, gene expression purely. So our group undertook um, a, uh, at the time, developing pattern recognition profile, which is now um, in uh, fairly routine use to try to see uh, with a more robust um, uh, computational strategy what subtypes we could really identify that we could really pin down and um, understand with uh, genetic profiles. And we found two. Uh, for lack of better knowledge, we call them clear cell A and clear cell B, CCA and CCB. So these are very distinct biologically. And when we looked at these tumors in terms of uh, their outcome, they also have a significant prognostic uh, relevance with the clear cell A tumors in this original cohort having a median survival of 103 months compared to the 24 months for CCB tumors. The TCGA, which has been uh, discussed here um, uh, in many of the previous talks, uh, was a great source for validation. Uh, we assigned these tumors to clear cell A and clear cell B uh, group subtypes and looked at survival, validating our uh, previous results with the clear cell A tumors having a much better survival profile than those clear cell B tumors. And so this classification scheme, which is based on somewhere between 34 and 120 gene uh, signature, can classify um, uh, uh, robust subdivisions of clear cell type renal cell carcinoma and can be applied with a small number of genes to individual tumors and independently associates with disease specific and overall survival, making it a valuable prognostic uh, biomarker. Now we used these profiles then to uh, understand a little bit more about the rare variant groups. This is still in the clear cell renal cell carcinoma arena, but when we took a very large group uh, of compiled tumors, uh, this was a meta-analysis of over 500 tumors, um, all histologically defined as clear cell type renal cell carcinoma, and we applied our expression uh, pattern recognition uh, uh, algorithm. Of course, when we asked for two groups, we found two, and they correlated with our clear cell A and clear cell B. But when we ask for three groups, we can find um, a small group that now filters out, now that we have the power in numbers, to identify um, uh, what we called cluster three. So what is in cluster three? So cluster three, um, as I said, are histologically defined clear cell renal cell carcinomas. But when we look at their gene expression profile, it's very different, particularly with regard to metabolic properties. And we see upregulation of genes that are involved in um, mitochondrial regulation and oxidative phosphorylation, suggesting a, a striking difference in the way these cells uh, or these tumors likely um, uh, regulate metabolism. In addition, now these are tumors that we can't uh, go back and genotype for von Hippel Lindau mutation or loss of chromosome 3P. But the loss of uh, VHL regulation leads to characteristic changes in the gene expression profile. And so when we use those gene expression changes to predict whether these tumors have an intact uh, VHL or a, a mutant VHL, wild type VHL here, um, uh, the wild type VHL signature here is shown in purple. And you can see that these purple tumors, the wild type VHL tumors, all tightly cluster with cluster three. So these are probably not clear cell renal cell carcinomas, although many, many pathologists call them that. So we pulled them out and said, do they look a little bit different? And my graduate student who did this work um, came right away and said there's something funky about these clear cell renal cell carcinomas that we call cluster three. As you can see in the top, these are a clear cell A and a clear cell B tumor. The cl they all have the clear cytoplasm. Um, and really what we've seen is that they're not distinct histologically, although they're very different molecularly and as I've shown, have a very different prognostic outcome. But the cluster three tumors, although the cells themselves might have cleared cytoplasm that gave them uh, the clear cell histology designation, they have a very uh, different pattern of organization with a papillary uh, uh, type um, uh, of feature. 
And so what we think that we've identified is a new rare variant of clear cell renal cell carcinoma that um, uh, simultaneously another group of pathologists identified and called clear cell papillary type renal cell carcinoma. And that suggests that really we need to take great care when we uh, treat these patients because what we have is clear cell type renal cell carcinoma, most of which are VHL mutated. We do have clear cell and clear cell B. These are the tumors we should be treating with these drugs that we've identified um, based on uh, the effect of the pathway that's activated by loss of VHL. But clear cell papillary renal cell carcinomas probably won't respond very well because they are VHL wild type, just like papillary type renal cell carcinomas don't respond well either. So to summarize this section, clear cell renal cell carcinoma can be just separated into two groups, A and B, based on transcript profiling, but that further clustering can identify biologically highly dissimilar subtypes within the clear cell group. And that subtyping can convey biological distinction as a valuable tool for prognostic evaluation and a likely cause for some of our poor responses to therapy. Okay. My title, I indicated that we would also turn to clinical trials for um, helping us understand clear cell renal cell carcinoma a little bit more. A clinical trial that we completed um, uh, some years ago, LCC 0603, was a neoadjuvant clinical trial that looked at the treatment of renal tumors with serafinib. Patients were um, identified as having a renal tumor and underwent a CT scan for basic size description and a PET scan. And then we're treated with serafinib. Uh, the, this is the first generation VEGF receptor, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, for four to eight weeks, and then underwent a, a post-treatment CT scan and PET scan, and then their nephrectomy. We're going to look um, at radiographic indicators of response uh, rather than molecular indicators. So first, standard resist criteria um, indicated that we do see partial responses. Again, there are no complete responses here. Um, many patients had, part, had uh, subpartial responses or minimal responses. Their tumors shrank but didn't meet this uh, standard criteria of 30 percent decrease in longest size. Some, some tumors actually grew. Now, what we realized as we looked at these tumors is that we probably need new ways to uh, describe response. The standard resist criteria response is really just based on longest diameter and measuring this in comparison after treatment. And I'll actually use this particular patient as the example. Here in the pretreatment, we have a very large renal tumor. Post-treatment, this tumor was still very large. In fact, measured slightly larger than it had been before. But if you look at this tumor, it's very different. The central area of this tumor is now uh, very dark, uh, indicating Necrosis is what we think, but we took these tumors out, and we can confirm that these dark areas are very necrotic. And so uh, we developed um, a new way to try to quantify the area of tumor that's actually killed in response to uh, this treatment. Similarly, we were doing PET scans on these patients, and we were doing that because we were trying to understand how the metabolic properties of these tumors might indicate how these patients would likely respond to this treatment. We see uh, and have known that there are some tumors that are very dim um, uh, on FDG PET. So this is a tumor. You can see it here. It's barely visible on the PET scan that doesn't take up any FDG. So uh, this tumor uh, has a, a metabolic profile that is not dependent on uptake of glucose. Other tumors, for example, this tumor, have regional areas that um, can be very high um, in terms of FDG uptake. And when we looked at um, these tumors, we discovered first that the non-clear cell histology tumors were much more likely to have high levels of FDG uptake. So metabolically active tumors um, were more likely in the clear cell group compared to the, uh, in the non-clear cell group. This is the papillary chromophobes um, and probably the papillary clear cell types um, than the clear cell group. Secondly, we um, discovered that the correlation between um, FDG uptake and response was somewhat different than what we might have expected. We might have expected that the more metabolically active tumors would be those that would respond better to an angiogenically targeted agent. But in fact, the opposite was true. The best responders were those that had very low levels of FDG uptake. 
And so we're still trying to understand exactly what that means. Certainly that means that those clear cell tumors are the ones most likely to respond, which is what we've known, and those are the ones with the lower levels of FTG activity. But um, uh, we continue to try to understand the metabolic properties of the tumors that make them uh, different and more likely to respond. And so that leads to our um, uh, next clinical trial. This is now ongoing. This is LCC 1028. It's a new adjuvant um, clinical trial using the newest generation. Um, uh, well, they're coming out so fast, actually, it's not the newest anymore, but the next to newest um, uh, VEGF receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Uh, patients now are getting a CT scan and a biopsy uh, to confirm, in fact, that they would be clear cell type renal cell carcinoma, and as well to allow us to do molecular studies um, that directly um, uh, measure their uh, metabolic activity and other um, uh, effects. They're being treated for eight weeks uh, with another CT scan, undergoing nephrectomy. And uh, we will then be able to look at clear cell variant histology. They'll all be clear cell going in, um, uh, but there may be variants um, included, as well as looking at their VHL mutation and other uh, mutational status, their transcript profile in particular, the clear cell A and clear cell B group, and um, other protein uh, expression signatures. And then finally, um, uh, looking at molecular and genetic contributions to intratumoral heterogeneity. I've told you that uh, encountering a group of patients with clear cell renal cell carcinoma uh, is a big heterogeneous group in terms of the histology and their molecular um, differences. But it turns out that when you dig down into the tumor, those tumors are heterogeneous too. So this is, of course, known for all tumors, um, that if you sample in multiple different places, the histology will look different. And in fact, the grade can be different depending on where you sample. So what does that mean molecularly? Well, a group at the Sanger Center um, published um, on a small number of tumors uh, that when they uh, sequenced these tumors, they find that while there are some mutations that are ubiquitous, meaning the mutation is found in all samples across the primary tumor and in the metastatic tumor, that there are mutations that are private. There are mutations that are um, uh, common only among the primary samples, and there are mutations that are common only among the metastases, and there are a lot of mutations that are unique to the individual sample. And so this makes um, uh, uh, a whole new level of complication as we move toward um, uh, personalized therapy, in particular therapy that's based on uh, biopsy metrics. This group actually looked at our clear cell A and clear cell B group subtypes. And what they saw when they looked at six samples from the primary tumor was that in five of the six uh, samples, um, the genes in, gene signature indicated that these would be clear cell B type tumors. So depending on your glass half full or glass half empty, the glass half full uh, version of this would be that five out of six times they picked that this patient would have poor outcome. And this patient has metastatic disease, so in fact that's true. The glass half empty would be that one out of six times you would pick wrong, and this patient would have been um, indicated to be a clear cell A type tumor, and you might have predicted that this patient would do well and in fact be wrong. Uh, so it helps us understand sort of the limitations of this test. But it also gives us an opportunity to um, understand a little bit more about these tumors. And so for the future, um, a trial that we've uh, really, uh, really just initiated um, is uniting some of these imaging observations that we've made uh, with tumor genetics. So we'll be taking patients, uh, and this is patient number one. Patient number two just had his MRI uh, last week, um, and doing an MR in coordination with a PET scan so that we can get a detailed look at these patients' um, uh, tissue perfusion and vascularity and the density of these tumors, as well as uh, regional areas of FDG uptake, and sample according to the map that's created by the um, uh, imaging, as well as samples that are uh, collected uh, based on what we see grossly in the tumor. Um, here you can see a sample that we collected uh, from a region that's uh, highly distinct from the uh, mostly uh, more pale yellow regions of the tumor. Um, now this has just begun, so I can't tell you how well we're going to be able to correlate the gene expression and uh, genetic underpinnings uh, between um, what we see on the tumor and what we see in the MR PET, but it will um, help us to be able to move forward. So to summarize, there are multiple ways for renal cell carcinoma to diverge. The subtypes can enrich tumor sets for clinical and genetic features, and a multi-platform approach that with genetics, molecular biology, and imaging will give us uh, many ways to tackle what's surprisingly a very heterogeneous disease.